Good day, this is Anna Galactic bringing you another presentation in our continuing series on our number system and mathematics in order to explore the geometry of modern physics. Particularly, we are interested in space-time and we want to consider much more closely the concept of light speed and today we are going to take a brief excursion, although a very important one, in order to consolidate our notion of time, which is quite an elusive concept, although we seem to have gotten somewhat of a grip on the notion of time from the geometry of space-time. We're going to take a quick look at that without getting bogged down in the infinite amount of complication and detail that that entails, because the Einstein formulation for gravity, which is now called space-time, is in fact a pseudo-geometry, and that's why it does not work. That's a relativistic statement, because it does work in local space, and we're going to talk about that. The way to introduce this subject, which is on two vectors, as you can tell, is first to come to extreme grip grips with the notion of a line. The line is the ruling object in all of science. The line is the basis of everything. And therefore, it's extremely frustrating, infuriating, that the very word line has two completely different meanings. And the fact that they're not incompletely different, I merely exaggerated, is extraordinarily confusing. It has confused mathematicians since the beginning of time. And the way to directly perceive that right out the gate so you have perfect understanding of what we're talking about, look at the straight line and then look at a circle. Those are the only two lines that human beings can see, and they are so utterly different that they comprise two completely different domains, and they describe extraordinarily related but extraordinarily skewed concepts of time and space. Space-time is a weaving together in orthogonal space of the 3D concept of space with a time arrow concept of time which is construed by Einstein using the Minkowski and Lorentz functions. It is considered to be linear. That is the greatest error interpreting curvature correctly. It goes right down to the fundamental basis of the Einstein field equation for space-time gravity and it directly influences the quantum mechanical paradox complex. Both of these formulations are incomplete and today we need to observe how the Einstein field equation is incomplete. This is extremely important or no progress further can be made in science and that has actually been true, rigorously provably true now. For 70 to 100 years science has been frozen in place facing the enormous abyss of the sins of its mathematical system. So the way to get at this is through pure geometry. No calculus, no tensors, no tangent field. We need to observe the difference between the two kinds of line in the universe and without a full and complete comprehensive understanding of the difference between the two lines that are used by the universe, there is no way to understand physics at the cutting edges. So the way we're going to approach this is first to make sure we understand what is a line. What is a line? 
There are two completely different answers to that question. So baffling and confounding have men made this subject through lack of direct perception. You will now obtain the direct perception needed to distinguish between the two fundamental objects that are used at the absolute basis of science. The first one is the straight line. The straight line is a derivative object. It has no inherent reality with a footnote having to do with the photon. You may already guess that we're approaching the light cone, which is a linear structure inside of 4D space-time. That is the only linearity in the space-time system is the light cone, but it is a straight line. There is a straight line in space-time. The rest of the lines are curved, and they're curved hyperbolically, but actually that's inside out. And the official, the actually conventional and accepted prefix to describe such a geometry, such as hyperbolic geometry in space-time, it is a pseudo-geometry. I want you to memorize that term and learn to use it all the time when you're thinking, or perhaps you will learn to speak this term intelligently as well but the concept of pseudo-geometry is intrinsic to any perfect concept of geometry which we require right now because the universe is perfect. There are no actual singularities in the physical universe. So the basic concept of the straight line is that it is smaller. It is geometrically smaller and it is quantitatively smaller than the circle. But that's not really an adequate way to find the difference between the two lines. As you have already surmised or realized or guessed, the other straight line, and the only other straight line that the human eye can see, the human physiology can perceive, is the closed line. The straight line is an open line, and watch, that's how you know it's open because these two points, as they have either velocity or changing position, or however you want to phrase, the polar opposite directions on a straight line drawn from an arbitrary center, you can see that it is split into two directions <clears throat> that go to two linear infinities. The circle has no such thing but it does have a form of infinity. But it's not open infinity because it's not linear infinity. <clears throat> the circle being the perfect closed line, we say normalized to indicate perfection. It's the reduction of general curvature to its simplest shape. That has always been known to be the circle. Just so you know, everything we say about the circle applies to the sphere. On an exact geometric and therefore an exact mathematical relationship, which in the basis or axiomatic formulation of either circular space or spherical space, is a two to one relationship. And you should memorize that and study it because there's a broad footnote. <clears throat> but it can be shown, I have shown, that the circle is exactly one half of a sphere that needs to be rigorously stated in exact terms that make sense. I can't go into that now, although I have gone into that in the past. And the only reason I mention that is because we're going to be talking about the circle. Why do we talk about the circle instead of the sphere? Because we can see a circle. There is another reason which is more profound. Every sphere has exactly 
one circle and they're identical. That is, they're identified with each other. A sphere has only one circle on it and a circle only designates one sphere. This is true both in space and time, but we haven't gotten to time yet. We're closing in on time by this seemingly roundabout method because time is not a linear concept. Einstein made a huge mistake and we celebrate his mistake for this reason. It is the difference between what is called local space and universal space. And it is extremely important. Everything is extremely important here. You've never heard this before because nobody thinks in these terms anymore. There probably was a time when men did, perhaps at the turn of the century, the first few decades of the 20th century, there was quite a flurry of intellectual activity among mathematicians and physicists because of Albert Einstein's incredible synthesis where he was able to show a direct relationship between space and time that works for local space. What is interesting is when you try to apply the Einstein formula for space-time, which is rather complex, I think anyone would admit, but it does work for local space and enables astrogation, which is a very little used word that is the older word or an alternate word for space travel. We have excellent capability of space travel within the solar system now, and we'll never find out if that has further reach because we'll never reach another star. You should accept that. It's mathematically provable that human beings will never reach the nearest star or stellar space. We're stuck in the solar system. But the fact that we can navigate the solar system is solely due to Einstein's discovery of special relativity because you have to account for the time lag. And he did that for gravity, but you can also do it for navigation. In order to compensate for the time lag in your instructions to a vehicle, a craft, a probe, such as the Cassini probe, it's over a billion miles away <laughs> around Saturn, there's a two hour time lag in the instructions sent to the craft. So you have to compute both the time lag <laughs> the time lag in by the time the instruction reaches the craft it will have moved and so you not only have to compute the time lag but you have to compute the time lag to a future position well the miracle that, that just solves all that complication by putting all the complexity into one equation that can be fed to a supercomputer and the supercomputer simply does all the work for us that is the signal main advantage of computer technology is that it saves us literally in the case of relativistic computations for space navigation it saves literally tens of thousands of hours of work for any simple set of instructions to send to the Cassini craft for instance would require tens of thousands of hours of intricately working out the Einstein field equation for space-time relativity. It works, but it works in the most difficult method possible. But it's the only one we know of, and therefore, even though there's a gigantic hole in space-time called a singularity, which we're approaching, nonetheless it's useful. The problem is, is that physicists have not really observed how their mathematical system affects their interpretation of cosmic space, which includes quantum space because that's at the other limit. That is going in rather than out. This brings us directly to a consideration of the circle. The straight line enables our number system the circle is the actuality of what we see in physics and what we can measure 
both at the atomic and subatomic level and at the cosmological and deep space astronomical level. That is, we're computing either gigantic objects, the largest of which would be considered the universe taken as a unit, and the other end of the spectrum is the infinitesimal, the indivisible nature of a quantum uh, requires a different form of mathematics in order to access what the quantum phenomena are. The same is also true in cosmology in computing the integral. These are the integral and infinitesimal aspects of cosmic geometry. They cannot be approached or solved in any way with linear algebra because the line simply is derivative with respect to the phenomena. The line as a measuring instrument or unit or whatever concept or idea of linear spatial separation breaks down. It doesn't work either for the infinitesimal which would be the electron or the proton or something at that scale. We do have quite a corpus of knowledge about things related to particles. This would be the standard model of subparticle physics. Those have to be called particles, but in fact they cannot be particles. It's very difficult to even say what is a particle. I have stated there's only one particle that you can state is a particle, and remain consistent, but you then need to completely redefine what a particle is because we've never gotten it right. But it can also be extended, that is the concept of the proton as the only particle in the universe. That is true, I've proved it. Well, Ruger, Boschkevich and I together proved it. That the proton is the only particle when defined correctly, but there is an extended form of the particle called the electron, and it too could be called a particle as long as you morph the word particle from its singular form, where it means a monad, to its true form, where it means one of two reciprocal objects. And the electron and the proton are reciprocal objects. That has never been fully realized. It certainly hasn't been developed. Because it's a direct geometrical perception that requires a series of insights that men just don't have time for. They're too seriously concerned with the calculus because the calculus is the zoo in which space-time exists. And in fact, all of modern physics, from the Dirac and Schrodinger equations to everything done in top-level physics now, certainly in the cosmic cutting edges, at the infinitesimal and integral limits, the linear algebra that we use to compute the natural structure of the universe breaks, period. It's that simple. It breaks. But of course it's not that simple if you want to understand it and talk about it. So the way to do that is to realize that the straight line is a unique line. It's a unique line in an infinite, but I, it's a, there's a better word than infinite here, and learn this word because we're going to be talking about it extensively. The straight line is an open line because it goes to two point-like infinities. The circle does not have any such infinity, but what it has instead is continuity. And the continuity of the circle defines a new data type. And now I'm going to read from some notes that I composed today. We are going to talk about the closed line, the open line, position, and the continuum and discrete space. And we're going to get to a system of forces. And this is Boschkevich's original discovery of the force balance system at the atomic level. 
So to cover this broad range of topics, I hope you're not daunted by that because they sound disparate or perhaps not related. They're directly related. And here's how it works. The closed line is a circle and the open line is a line. That is a straight line. And those are the only two simple lines in the universe. Except that for now, it's utterly true due to the fundamental change in what is a line. Because we think of a line traditionally as being the open line because it's the open line that defines our number system. However, the closed line is completely unrelated to the straight line except in one known sense which has been known since ancient times. And that's the relation between the circumference, which is in fact the closed line, which we call the circle, the relationship between that circle, which we call the circumference, because we want to interpret it as linear distance. Of course, that's impossible, but the way it's approximated is with the very famous uh, pseudo number. This is a pseudo number. We call it an irrational number. That is correct. It is irrational. But it's a definition of irrationality that can be classed. That is, it can be typed under a class because irrationality is a specific interpretation of something more fundamental. The concept, which you have certainly never heard of, or if you have, you've never developed it because no one ever develops this idea, is that the closed line, being the circle, has a radius. An, equi an equivalent way of saying that, which has caused endless confusion because of the absolute confusion of mathematicians and physicists over this very directly perceivable distinction is that the open line or straight line has our number system on it and therefore we think that we're constrained to those numbers but actually when you get to the circle you find out that you need that number system. Nobody has ever thought of that. Not once. Not in the annals of science. So the new number system is actually the original number system, and the reason for saying that is that the linear number system, which is exactly equivalent to the line, the open line, that number system is precisely the derivative number system of circular space, which has its own number system. So the circle is original, and we've never used it. I find that to be perhaps among the most remarkable statements that it has ever been possible to make in science, in directly implying that it is provable. I proved it in 2022 with my antipodal theorem, which is watertight. And therefore I can state with absolute certainty and authority that our linear number system is incorrect. And that's strictly in context Strictly in context, you have to listen to this entire sequence of the past 25 minutes to be sure that you don't misinterpret what I just said. Because if you do misinterpret it, it's entirely your fault. It's not due to any lack of a expression on my part. It's due to a lack in your ability to understand this. So... Credit where credit is due, and if you don't get it, it's your fault. Now, I take this greatly personally that I want you to get this, 
but I, uh, all I can do is keep trying. I make progress each time I do this for myself. Oh, this is totally open-ended. The possibilities for discovery now are, are absolutely Pandora's box wide open. I've already made two to three dozen major discoveries just using this geometry, so it's quite significant. But for you to get in at the ground floor so that you can share this with me, that's what science is. I will endeavor to explain to you the numeric difference and geometric difference and ultimately how this affects space-time, the difference between the closed number system and the open number system. The open number system should be self-evident to you what I mean by that by now. It's simply the mathematical system used by science is an open number system called the linear number system because it's based on the open line construct of number metricization. There is a second number metricization open to us that's given to us by the universe and therefore we are blueprinted to see this. The fact that I am the first man to see this does not phase me in the slightest either towards megalomania or humility. I simply cannot afford to have an emotional reaction, certainly not at this hour. So the official name for the number system that the universe uses, and which physics someday will use, but not anytime soon, <laughs> unless a miracle happens, but this is the new number system that solves all the problems in physics, mathematics, and education. It's the one single solution that unlocks the Pandora's box of physics so that we can get the answer to the quantum paradox and we can finally understand the structure of the universe, which so far has been completely out of reach of mathematical physics. So, the proportional number system is the name of the correct number system which currently science does not use but it is being used by the universe and it fully explains space-time and solves the problem of the singularity and also defines time for the first time in human history. So let's see if we can wrap this up quickly by beginning with the concept of the open number system which is the linear quantum number system. It's a special case of quantization because every number on that line is a particle. The open number line defines particle numbers. They are position numbers and that's all they are. You can say it in a couple of ways, I just did, but it's very simple. In order to have a number system on the open line, you have to quantize it and you quantize it linearly. So it's not really uh, directly related to the quantum such as it is used as a term in physics. It's a strictly mathematical and logical proposition. It is called indivisibility. In certain constructions it's called impenetrability. But what all that means is it's the exact opposite of continuity. And continuity is the aspect that we learn from the circle. The circle manifests continuity. It does not manifest linearity. The circle is not linear and it cannot be linearized. But if you, well actually it can be, but on a very specific calculus formula. And that results in the direct relationship between the linear distance around the circle, which is oxymoronic, it's, it's a foolish thing to say, but as a puzzle, it's perfectly reasonable to ask the question, what is the relationship between the straight line distance and the distance around the circle? They're not directly commensurable. 
but you can approximate it. And that approximation has an ancient name, Tau. <laughs> uh, I just lied. Let me explain why you may not have ever heard of Tau. I'll bet you have. It's a very good term because of the relationship between Tau and Pi is extremely simple. The relationship between Tau and Pi is 2 to 1. It's 2 to 1. Yes, the simple harmonic, the simple oscillator, you make that connection. If you've been listening to my last few lectures, you certainly have made the connection. But without making that connection explicitly right now, we simply observe that the way to linearize the circle this is without using the sine cosine split to get a two value solution. We don't want that. Well, that's not the question. It's a different puzzle. But <laughs> the, we use sine cosine to get the two parameter solution for the circle. That has been miraculous, but it's irrational and we don't need it in the true number system. It doesn't exist. So instead of using sine cosine, to get a two component solution for the circle, we want the one component linear solution for the linear distance around the circumference of the circle. That is tau. And that's the relationship with the radius. But since the relationship of the radius to the diameter is one to two, you can say that the radius of the diameter to the circumference is one half tau. And that's the ancient number that you know of as pi. So that's the meaning of pi. One of the most infuriating, unnatural numbers that's ever been discovered. It horrified the Greeks, as did the square root of two, because they discovered through meticulous mathematical investigation, really geometric investigation, that's what the Greeks were known for, they discovered that the square root of 2, which is the diagonal on a, on a unit square, that is irrational. That confounded the Pythagoreans to the point of suicide. They just we took this very personally. Well, that's the wrong way to react to the universe. What you want to do is learn from the universe and take your chastisement and correct yourself, not try to fix the universe, and move onward under the tutelage of the master. We are at the feet of the universe and the universe does not make mistakes. It doesn't use illogic. It doesn't have probability. It's not a cuckoo clock, although logically it is. Now, when we look at the circle, we realize that it is not a line. It's not a line in several senses. It's not open. It does not go to any infinity and it has a peculiar aspect that it has no beginning and has no end. The term for that is continuum. Continuum. A Latin word which we've adopted into English. Continuum. The definition of the continuum in geometry is the circle for the reasons that I just stated. So that is an absolutely monumentally philosophical difference, isn't it? Because now we're addressing the problems that exist in quantum mechanics and in cosmology, the nature of continuity. It's the direct antithesis of the fundamental concept of the physical quantum, which is not continuous. That's what quantum means. Discontinuous. A synonym for that is particle. And a synonym for that is location. And the better word than location, much more precise, position. Spatial position. On a circle, there is no such thing. There is not spatial position because it's not in space. The circle does not exist in linear space. It exists in its own space that has its own geometry and its own mathematics and its own logic. It's all extensible from linear logic, so it all makes sense, but it's integral. And so it just shocks the socks off of anybody 
who touches this. There's a reason we want to get the formula for the circle. We cannot do it. We've never done it. And instead of getting the formula for the circle, we've used calculus and the sine-cosine relationship, and now we have complex numbers. These are all complete kludges. They're inadequate. They do not solve the problem. What they do is an enable linear approximation, which gets us precision enough for space travel. And for many other functions, all of which work ideally on Earth for technology. And that's why linear algebra amazes, amazes us to the point of religious reverence. That's being suppressed these days by a mysterious force, but no need to get into spooky aspects. I'll simply state it logically. Men are absolutely stymied by reality. And when they attempt to acquire truth from reality, what they end up with is a model, and the linear algebra system is nothing more and nothing less than a model. It's a grid model that we slap on the face of the universe that does not understand the grid. So we blame the universe for everything that goes wrong and the main blasphemy that we hurl at the universe, we put right at the center of the supermassive black hole. We call it a singularity. And now we're going to discover just exactly what that is so that you know what it is. And you don't have to be led around by the nose by these pseudo-mathematicians. They're using pseudo-mathematics. Because it's based in pseudo-geometry, it doesn't work. You cannot begin with a line in physics. If you do, you end up with the Einstein field equation and the Dirac equation and the Schrodinger equation and the Bessel function, for you electrodynamics fans, nightmarish, absolutely contrary to the spirit of science, not at all contrary to the spirit of technology. And that's the difference. We need the linear system for technology. It extends us into space through the use of space-time. Therefore, the model is considered complete to a new threshold such that it is worshipful it is worshipped in the place of reality. You may detect a religious overtone. That's too bad. I did not say anything about religion, except I used the word blasphemy, but I'm using it in the logical sense that you're using the wrong tool for the job that you're trying to perform. If you're trying to understand the universe, either at the infinitesimal limit, which we are, and at the integral limit, which we are, you're going to get the wrong solution if you continue to use the wrong tool. And the only solution to this incredible dilemma is to change number systems, and that was up to me to discover that. We've come 40 minutes, and now we're going to complete this so we get a new definition of time and a definition of the singularity. They may seem unrelated. They're not. You'll see why. When you start with a circle, you realize that that is another dimension. The correct term is not dimension, although it should be. We would have to steal back the word dimension from its use consistently now as linear dimensions. One, two, three, four. Those are linear dimensions. And it speaks of the number of lines being used to make your grid. It's very simple, the linear dimensional system. This is not linear, and therefore we need a new definition for what we would otherwise wish to call a dimension. And that word is domain. And so we get now to a two-domain system of the circle. The circle has two dimensions, which we now call domains because they're two different data types. The circle manifests two related data types. They are locked together, so it's actually one data type, which currently, under the linear construct, is called space-time. The word space means one, and the word time means two. And so it's a two-domain solution. 
it introduces a new domain that is considered by Albert Einstein to be orthogonal with cubic space. That is an orthogonal relationship in linear space that does not actually exist or work. And the result of doing that is you get a singularity. But first, let's concentrate on our main vector, which is to understand the circle as a new dimension. The reason it's a new dimension is that it is a line, but it leaves the linear space originally. It does not begin in linear space, and it has nothing to do with linear space. But in order to show that the two spaces are related, you can say correctly that the linear space, which is simply one straight line, that's linear space. The linear system makes higher orders of space, flat space and cubic space and hypercubic space, as you know. Though we don't want to use those concepts because they're based entirely on the line. In this case, we have a different kind of line that has a two-dimensional parameterization. It's parameterized on two numbers of different data type. And under the Einstein field equation, the two domains are called space and time. Under the circular geometry, obviously one is space. And it's the space that is constrained to the closed line. So it's the circumference itself is a dimension. And there's one other dimension that is not understood at all by physics, but it should have been by now. But I fully understand why physics, that is no physicist that has ever gotten this. It's because the data type is so obvious that it just has escaped attention. Because if you have the closed circle, that is the closed line we call the circle, and the circumference is the dimension, directly equivalent to the dimension of the 1D line, that's a 1D space. This is a 2D space, but only the, we would say, line component, the, it's, yeah, we don't have another word, but it's really the curve. And the, the straight line is a special case of a curve where the curvature disappears and it flattens out. But everything else in the universe is curved. The straight line is a very, very tiny part of circular space. It's the derivative notion and the exact relation is tau, so that the circle is inherently, we would say, about six times bigger. But that does not at all describe the difference. Because again, you're using the linear concept of distance when there is no such thing. It's a two-component distance, but that violates our concept of distance, which is always a one-component distance. Actually, in space-time, it's a four-component difference. When you factor in time into spatial separation, you can do so using a cubic basis and then extend the system to make hypercubic space. But when you add time, it's actually... you're adding a derivative number to a derivative system. And that's why it works, is because you're using four derivative numbers, but the three spatial dimensions are peculiarly related as derivative numbers, extremely difficult to compute. When you add time, it's very nearly impossible to compute, but it can be done with what are called gamma terms, which rely on the Christoffel symbol, which is a way of rationalizing differential geometry. And this leads you into the Riemannian sphere and pseudo-Riemannian space, all of which forms the basis of the EFE. We don't want any of that because all of the complication arises from using linearity as an inherent concept in circular space. You cannot do that. You must switch number systems. And now we discover, I discovered in 2022, that the number system of natural space 
because the circle is natural and the line is derivative, the circle is integral with respect to the line, and we're going to get to that. The approximate numeric difference, if we interpret it linearly, is about 6.28 dot dot dot, but that's an irrational relationship that we need to consign to the translator function as is done with conjugate algebra to get the numbers, the linear numbers, out of complex space. That requires a translator. That has been done and that's why complex numbers are so useful. But these are proportional numbers and the translator is the calculus. That we get the linear number system by a calculus derivation. That's why there are an infinite number of infinities on the straight line. Do you know how many infinities there are in circular space? It depends on how you approach that question or puzzle. But essentially, there are two. And there are only two. And there are always and ever only two infinities in real space. They're the inner infinity and the outer infinity. There are no other infinities. So this is a monumental leap forward. Much more powerful than a man stepping onto the moon from a lunar craft and saying a small step for man, a giant leap for mankind, horseshit. A small step for man, but a giant leap for mankind is my discovery of the proportional number system for circular, which I call natural space. It is a two component number. A two component number fully parameterizes the circle. And the relationship between the two numbers for what we would call the omega circle, which is the invert unit circle, where one is transferred from the radius, that would be the unit circle, to the circumference, that is the omega circle. The omega circle has a linear value of 6.28 based on a radius of one. We invert that. And the circle now has a circumference of one with an irrational radius that can be computed directly as the inverse of tau. So that is the ultimate translator between circular and linear space. That the linear radius of the circle is the circular inverse of tau. And by that simple inversion, you now get the correct number for the circle, the closed line, the perfect line is a circle with a value of 1. And I told you that's a proportional number, so I did not say that number completely. That is the linear value. The linear value of the circumference of the circle is 1. But that is not its actual value. It's the linearized value of the actual value. The actual value is one proportion one, and we write that as a fraction because we call it division, but it's actually proportionality. It's one over one. It's one divided by one. It's one into one. It's one in the numerator and one in the denominator, and that is the full parameterization of the circle in natural space. And that is the beginning of the actual number system used by the universe, which, as you can see, does not have zero in it. There's no zero in the universe. There's no such number. You can say that there is if you're using linear algebra because you require the zero for linear spatial separation. But other than that, the zero does not exist for this geometric region, reason. It is the differential of the line. It is the derivative quantity of the line. It is the infinitesimal quantity that balances the two linear infinities on add. And that's the definition of the line, is that it has a center, which if you give it a numeric value in order to measure linear spatial separation to infinity, you begin at zero. And so zero and infinity are dual numbers in linear space. We also have a dual infinity in circular space, but it's not linear infinity. It's the dual form of plus minus infinity. 
which in proportional space, instead of adding to zero, it multiplies to one, and therefore we have a number inside the circle and another number outside the circle if we use inversive linear geometry, which is a very fascinating subject. But actually, from the discovery made by Einstein, we know that that's the polar opposite going in and out would be polar opposites on a line. Instead, if you're going to linearize the relationship between the numerator and denominator numbers of the unit, that is the omega circle, one proportion one is the proportion of the arc lengths to the number of event points. That's a new definition, and it's the only correct definition, and gives, gives us for the first time the definition of time. As a new data type, which can now be translated out of Albert Einstein's incorrect formulation, which is a linear formulation and cannot be true, it's not true. It's only true in local space because of our ability to use the calculus. That's an illegal operation. You're not allowed to use calculus unless you're going to use linear geometry. We're not going to use linear geometry, but it's very important to realize at the outset you're not losing linear geometry at all. This is the integral of linear geometry. So, rather than having zero as the infinitesimal, that's a false number. It's not even quite real in linear space, and it leads to the singularity. I won't go into that now because we're approaching an hour, but let's home in on the definition of time as a point on the circle. When the circle is considered to have no time component, <laughs> it's only considered to be spatial, then you can use our common notion of a point system to get event space out of the circle. It's event space that Einstein was referring to when he manufactured his relationship between time and space. That is the relationship between two derivative concepts. The derivative concept of time is already derivative. The derivative concept of space is the linearization of spherical space. So the sphere, the sphere is not used and the concept of the point has to be zero. And quantum numbers, that is linear numbers, discrete numbers. In circular space, the numbers are not discrete. They're continuous. And that's the key word. That's the word that physics needs to start using. Because circular space is continuous. It doesn't have points. But here's the analog to the point. On a line, a point is a number. On the circle, the, the number is not a point, rather it's an event, and that's not a position. So it's not a point in the linear sense, which is a position. It's a position on the line. This is not, strictly speaking, a position because it's a relative concept, and this is the true definition of relativity, which is the relativity of event space to position space, that is to space space and the part that we call time, the time space in the geometric sense of a different space that's not spatial, that's not time. It's event space. And from event space, we get two derivative concepts. One of those is time. The other one is continuity. And this means that the circle represents the continuity of time. And that is the continuity that exists in the universe. It's the continuity of time. Now in space, the continuity is expressed as a force balance of two continuous forces. Those are fields. Here on the circle, the circle may be considered the field of temporal space, the field of event space. And the two components that make the relationship that defines the omega circle is the concept of arc length. That's also wavelength, by the way. The circle is a wave. The circle is the wave. The particle is the quantum. But the circle is the wave. 
and the circle is a perfect wave, and if it has no periodicity, it's called a static or geometric circle. But actually, we already know from physics, there is no such thing as a static circle. All circles, inherently, when you draw a circle, you drew, you drew the symbol for motion. You also drew the symbol for energy and for frequency and wavelength. We want to concentrate on frequency and wavelength now because the wavelength on the omega circle is 1. The circle has a wavelength of 1. All right, what's its frequency? 1. And that's why the definition, the parameterization of the circle which defines it in geometry and therefore in mathematics as well, is the relationship of one frequency to one wavelength. That does not exist. It does not exist because it would imply there's no motion. The way you get motion is by applying a point to the circle. When we do this in traditional linear geometry, linear mathematics, linear algebra, we always try to make one point. That is not possible. Max Planck proved that there's no such thing as a one-point circle. All circles begin with the simplest circle on the relationship between two and one. Uh, we could say that. That's going a little ahead. Scratch that. Well, you're actually going to see it, so I don't, I don't have to scratch it. You see, I'm scratching my head. As I, uh, it's quite interesting, yes. I told myself to scratch. So what happens if you put two points on the circle? If you put two points on the circle, you've discovered the same thing that Max Planck discovered, that you can quantize the circle. But did you? You did, but not linearly. What did you do when you made two points on the circle? Well, we just assume that they're balanced, symmetrical. So they're polar opposite on the circle, right? What does that do to the length of the circumference? Divides it in half. So if you have a frequency of two, those would be the number of points, you have a wavelength of one half. And that is the simple harmonic. That is the simple oscillator. This is well known, but I'm introducing this a bit early just to whet your appetite. That now you have a new form of mathematics and a new form of geometry that's based on multiplication not on add, that gets rid of all need for sine cosine calculus and complex numbers. Because now we have just achieved what those intended to achieve but could not because of the myopia of linear vision. Now we're seeing curvature. This is simple curvature. The omega circle is a purely geometric object which does not match physics. But when you put two events on it, you have a new data type that defines event space in a dimension that we cannot see. And that fully explains the flight of the photon, which defines the quantum paradox completely. We'll be back with more. I hope you tune in. We're homing in on the secrets of the universe. We're going to get a lot more. I hope you stay tuned.